good morning on this beautiful day. Now it so happens that I do videos that uh, go beyond primitive archery. I did videos on a rokad and also ones say that that dealt with other subjects. I currently have one or two that have to deal with astronomy, maybe in a general way. By doing videos that go beyond primitive archery, I found that I've picked up viewers who are interested in one subject and then discover, say, bows and arrows that are unlike the ones that they're familiar with. And I've received actually quite a few questions about them, which is great. You know, no matter what kind of like vehicle you want to pull logs through the woods with or just, you know, enjoy um, exploring, or whether or not you believe the earth is this way or that way, it doesn't matter. You know, really, in the greater scheme of things, everyone has the right to believe the way they want to believe. What does matter is that you found a primitive archery site. And because you're not necessarily familiar with this stuff, I'm getting quite a few questions on my email and also texting because you know you email me I'll give you my cell phone number and we can text back and forth and get kind of a <clears throat> you know a more personal communication going as far as questioning me about things or just discussing whatever in its basic form and this is going to be in regards to the questions I get <clears throat> in its basic form a bow is a stick that bends and in doing so it stores energy and then when you release the arrow, you know, it releases that energy in a quick way. Basic stuff. Now beyond that, I've gotten questions about the kinds of wood. And typically, the bows, unless they're made out of yew or juniper, other um, conifers such as, uh, what would that be, cypress, which is actually, you know, juniper and, and and cedar are in the cypress family. They're typically hardwoods, hard hardwoods. Willow, um, let's see, cottonwood. The various members of the poplar family are hardwoods, but they're they're soft hardwoods, so you wouldn't really go with that for a bow. You'd think of say hickory or maple or the oaks or hop horn beamer. We can call it ironwood in certain ways, although blue beech is an ironwood. You get my drift. Now, building bows that aren't laminated with, say, sinew or rawhide, I'm not going to talk about fiberglass and stuff like that, the modern com composite materials. These are called self bows. That just means it's made out of one piece of wood. You'll have a certain length and a certain width and a certain thickness and even a certain cross section through here. That all goes to the design of the bow, which I'm not going to really get into so much. I'll just say that the longer the bow is, the less of degree of bending that has to go through. This is actually a pretty heavy bow. I'm not going to bend it back all the way. The less, um, say, bending radius it will have, so there's less, say, concentrated forces of compression and tension because... These are terms for you if you're not familiar with it. This is the back, the side facing away from you, and this is under tension. The side facing you is under compression. So you have to consider, you know, in your design and the kind of wood you have and how far you bend it, which has to do with the bending radius, that amount of curve that you put into it. You have to take into account the physics, the mechanics, really, of this stretching and this squishing. Running down between them is that, that plane, that area where nothing really is going on except it's bending. That's the neutral plane. So you have the back tension, the neutral plane down the center, um, neutral, and then the belly side under compression. Take all this into account. Now bow strings, and I'm jumping because I'm not going to get into a tremendously long soliloquy of how these things operate. The bowstring is another component. If you notice, if you are of sharp eye, this does not have, it has a loop, it has a sliding loop because I might even take the string off, maybe I'm not, but there's a loop that I 
I twist it into this, and then this, the fall, using kind of tree worker terms, goes through that loop so it chokes it, and then on this side, it's tied. This is a sinew bowstring, and it's made out of this material, which I also use to laminate onto the back of the bows. Nice fluffy fibers, made from the Achilles tendon of a deer. You pound it, you remove the sheath, which is not really a strong material, it just kind of peels off like thin pieces of paper. You separate it into three parts. If it's white-tailed deer, typically you're not going to use the short, straight section. If it's elk, it's long enough. Then you get two more pieces that are shaped like Y's. One is easy to pull apart, the other one is braided. Not going to get into that, but tendons pounded after they're dry. Creates these fibers that you can, you can twist using a two-ply reverse twisted technique. It's just like making a two-ply rope and you can make them as long as you want. I actually didn't trim the little fuzzies off. Each one of these fuzzies represents where that fiber started and ended. And then it's just a matter of, say, technique as far as maintaining an even diameter. And maintaining, look at this, more, it's more evident in some spots, but this is a good spot right here. Same diameter, both plies, and they're twisted in a way so it's not one straight one and one spiraling around it. Not really either here nor there. The reason I personally don't have two loop strings on the bows that I sell when I make the bow string out of B50, which is a Dacron, it's not like artificial sinew that you'll see in a row, in a roll. That's nylon, it has more stretch. The Dacron has less stretch, so it's more efficient. Stuff like Fast Flight, not to get too much in, has less stretch, and then the cable systems on compound bows have almost no stretch whatsoever. What happens is you do need a little bit of stretch on here just to kind of cushion um, the shock from releasing and an arrow going. So a little bit of stretch does help. The reason I like these tied on ends, the reason I have to have this tied on end with sinew, and if you use like twisted squirrel rawhide to make your strings too, which is another way to do it, they're natural materials that have a certain stretch to them in relation to the humidity, so having a tight on end allows you the opportunity to adjust the brace height, new term for you, that's the distance from here to here. This is the brace height. Some people measure it from the back um, to the string, but you know, that's neither here nor there. Brace height measures it. Questions I get, John, do you ever put um, notches in your bows or arrow shells in them? And my simple answer is, Usually, no. I think I've done it two or three times just because a customer was really adamant to have an arrow shelf. But what I did was I just put, um, glued a little wedge there so the arrow was riding on that wedge and not your hand. Now, that isn't really the same as an arrow shelf because an arrow shelf cuts into the bow and brings, I need my arrow here. This is a funny thing, arrow paradox or bow paradox or paradox if you want to say that. When I'm aiming this at you, the arrow is actually going that way. And so as it goes goes whizzing past the handle, it actually bends around the bow, does a little of these things and responds. As you start cutting into the bow, you're reducing the amount that that arrow has to go around. When you increase the brace height, you do the same thing. Japanese Yumi, they avoid the whole thing by just, they would shoot it off this side, which is different. I don't know if they use a thumb ring, I'm not into that. But they'll actually, upon release, turn the bow like this, which gets the bow out of the way of the arrows it's flying, so they go straight. Spine weight, or the measurement of spine on an arrow, it's how stiff this is. And if it's too stiff, it's not going to bend around the bow right. If it's too flexible, it's not going to bend around the bow weight right. So you do have to say make sure that your arrows have that stiffness that matches the bow. And the wider the bow, um, the more conscious you have to be of spine. Another little trick is that I find because I'll use the same arrows for a wide range of bow draw weights and I'll get to that and bow styles and so I make my arrows longer and when you lengthen the arrows they're less susceptible to differences of spine. Now shooting off your hand. 
questions I get. Do you just shoot your arrows off your hand? And my answer, my case and a lot of your cases, is yes. And so, there is an issue. If you're fletching, the feathers here don't have nice smooth leading edges or if that vein, that part of the feather that the feathery parts are attached to, is lifting off of your arrow, you're going to run into trouble. You're going to cut your hand. In some cases, and it's happened to me, I've gotten so lazy that I just shot bad arrows and I've had the feather driven through my hand. Now, one way to do that, these are very old arrows, over 20 years old, is I sinew, or I fletch them with sinew. Got this, the head is like attached with sinew, wrapping it. And so that sinew holds things down and it makes a very smooth transition as it's going over it. If you're not getting arrows for your bow that have sinew on that leading edge, you can get fletch tight, which is a cement for gluing arrows down there. People use jigs which clamp onto the arrow and then the arrow is held in this device and the feather goes down there and it's held at a very, very precise angle to get spiral or straight or whatever. And the fletch tight is a good good gloppy gluey stuff that you can just smear over that and then sand it down to make it smooth and it'll help hold that down. In lieu of just shooting off your hand, another thing you can do is get a shooting glove, which is a you know a little leather glove. It wouldn't necessarily have to have fingers. It could be like a fingerless glove. But that allows the arrow to slide over leather, which will protect your hand if you're not confident in your arrows. What else? What other questions? Well, I hope I've guided you to certain things. You can... Oh, tiller. How many times in the past, in the recent past, have I made a video where I'm talking about tiller? And I've never really explained what it is. Tiller is just the process of getting a bend in here. And that is the process of removing wood and then putting it on a tillering tree or a tillering stick, which is, I should have brought one here, a piece of wood, a little notch right there, a groove or what have you to hold it, that holds it onto the bow. And it notches along the length so you can take the string and stick it in there and look at it. But tillering at its, its basic level is just thinning the bow to get that bend and then thinning it in a way to get it at a draw weight and draw length. Aha! Two more terms which if you came over here from like a video on the spherical earth or row cons, you might not even really know. I don't know how much you've talked about bows in the past or used them. The draw weight is literally how much poundage a pull am I putting onto this thing. And I, take, I have a thing that looks like a fish scale, and I'll take an arrow, tie it to this so it doesn't fall off, it has marks for distance, and I'll go for a short bow, 23 inches, measure it at 23 inches, and at 23 inches, I'm putting a, or applying a pull of 45 pounds. So that bow, 45 pounds at 23 inches of draw. If I pulled it back to 28 inches and it was 57 pounds, that bow would be a bow of 57 pounds at 28 inches. English long bow, maybe drawing it to your ear, 32 inches. 60 and a half pounds, well I'm not going to get 60 and a half because things aren't that precise. 60 pounds at 31 inches, it's just how you measure bows. Um, and I do believe that is about it. Don't be afraid to ask questions. There are a lot of people that watch my videos who are very good bow builders. And so if I don't answer your question to your, your liking, I'm sure somebody else will step in. Because one of the responsibilities of being involved in primitive archery is teaching other people. And please, really, don't be afraid of asking anything, even if it's the most basic questions, because we're not born with this knowledge. We pick it up by learning from other people. And as they say in school, there's nothing, there's uh, no such thing as a stupid question. They're really it. Well, there are stupid questions, but anything that you would ask about primitive bows or how they function or the terminology is not a stupid question. And you are very, very welcome to ask anything. Hmm. I think that's
that's about it. Oh, one last thing. Is if you're looking for a reference, yes, I am plugging the book that I wrote. It's called A Bowmaker's Notebook. But I went about it in a slightly different way than other books, which are also good instructional manuals. Is I get into a lot of thinking and theory about length, width, um, thickness, design of the bows, and plus I have three build-along projects. I have a bow project, which is just a simple D bow, and a D just means, look at that, it looks like the letter D. It bends throughout the entire length. Simple D bow. Good, reliable bow. The second project bow is a board bow. Yes, you can make board bows out of boards you buy at a big box store. Red oak is a lovely bow making material, and if you can't go out and gather wood, buy a board. And so my second one is a traditional American style longbow made from a board with the dimensions and everything in there. And it also talks about backing with deer rawhide. Rawhide is used to put on the back of bows to keep them from exploding. It also makes a really good surface for painting. You could either just make the board bow as a self bow, which just means one piece of wood. Well, you do have to glue the handle on to make it thicker. But in, some people will say that's not a self bow. Others will because the bending portion is one piece. Not going to get into the politics of bowery. And the third one is a horse bow, like a Northern Plains, North American style horse bow. Um, differs from an Asiatic or a European horse bow because they also use horn on the belly because horn is a great compressive material. This just uses wood and sinew. And so you're going to learn how to take a green piece of wood, not dry yet, you cut it, it's a green piece of wood, it's still pliable. You're going to learn how to take that pliable piece and shape it, lashing it to a board and blocking it up in parts, blocking, literally sticking blocks of wood under the parts you want to raise, letting it dry, talk about drying, and then there's also a thing on sinew backing. A couple other chapters in there, but my book is A Bowmaker's Notebook, available on Amazon in either an ebook or a paperback, and you can also, if you have a Kindle account, read it from there. Now I can say goodbye and get back to work. Thank you for your viewership. I appreciate your civility and your appreciation for primitive archery. Ask questions. Ask lots of questions. Thank you very much.